We welcome all of you to the question answer session. We are eagerly waiting for your questions, especially we are having after a long time. Before that, I would like to introduce the TA to this course who has done an excellent job as far as the lab session is concerned. He has single handedly developed all the codes for this uh, course. Uh, he is Vishesh Agarwal. He has done his master's years and now he is uh, working with us. So, we are happy to say that. Uh, all the codes have been developed by him. Now let us go to the uh, Mufakam Jha College. Sir, please now. refer to topic number 1 and slide number 73. See whether the flow is along the axis of the cylinder or it is uh, or it is uh, in the theta direction of the cylinder. The flow direction is the horizontal direction. It is so, the inlet flow is horizontal, although when it reaches close to the cylinder, it moves up and down, then it becomes in velocities in the angular direction, but the inlet velocity is horizontal. Is this answers your question? Uh, is it a flow over the cylinder or uh, is it a pipe or cylinder? It is a cylinder, it is a uh, solid cylinder, we are taking a two dimensional flow and the length of this cylinder perpendicular to this plane is infinite. It is, it is an external flow, it is not an internal flow. External flow across a circular solid cylinder. So, in that case, the flow direction, uh, I mean uh, the description is not so easy uh, the way it is written and it becomes more complicated. Uh, I think what you are trying to point out is that this is a problem which is not in the uh, Cartesian or a cylindrical coordinate system because uh, the <coughs> there are two domains, outer domain which is Cartesian in nature and the inner domain which is uh, circular in nature. So, we need to use a body fitted curvilinear grid which are not aligned along the any coordinate system. So, we need to have a complex geometry formulation. Whether this answers your question, I am not sure about it. Cylinder, it is written free slip and no slip. So, what is the condition? that is persisting there. Okay, his question is uh, the boundary conditions which I am showing here is no slip here on the surface of the cylinder and free slip on the top and bottom wall of the boundary. Uh, <coughs> this is a solid surface, on a solid surface you always have a no slip boundary condition. So, I hope this is fine to you. Now, whenever we do a CFD computation, even if it is an external flow, so, when we take an external flow, strictly speaking the size of the domain is infinite. However, we have to limit to region in space to do a CFD simulation. So, we need a, to close this circular cylinder. So, there is a bottom wall and the top wall of the domain where we have to use a boundary condition and you can also use u is equals to u infinity, but, but I had mentioned that this free slip boundary condition is better as compared to u is equals to infinity on the top and the bottom wall. So, this is a no slip boundary condition, this is what is called as a free slip boundary condition. Note that however, this is not an internal flow. This boundary condition is used for external flow only. Sir, please uh, uh, refer to topic number 2 uh, and slide number 36 and slide number 36. Uh, could you just uh, give a brief clarification? of the calculations. Okay, I think the question is on uh, the values which I am showing you here. Uh, <coughs> so, what I am saying is let us take, this is just a sample calculation, let me show the problem first. In this case, we are taking the <coughs> length of the domain as 5. So, in this we are doing 5 equal divisions, so delta x is equal to 1. So, this is, so if I tell the x coordinate this is x equals to 0, this is x is equals to uh, 0.5, this is 1.5, this is 2.5, this is 3.5, this is 4.5 and this is 5. 
So, with this distribution of the x coordinate at different grid points, just to show a sample calculation, uh, we are taking a case where let us suppose the surface area, as it is a one dimensional problem, the dimension perpendicular in the vertical direction as well as perpendicular to this plane, the dimensions we are taking unity. So, surface area you can easily take as unity. For simplicity in the calculations, in the number distribution, we are just taking the thermophysical property, density, specific heat, conductivity as unity. Delta x in this problem, the way have we have discretized, delta x you know it is equal to 1. Time step also for simplicity we are taking unity. So, if you substitute these values into this discretized equation, you end up with an equation where temperature at a new time level is equals to temperature of the old time level plus the difference of the heat fluxes on the west face of the control volume and on the east face of the control volume. So, what I to show the sample calculation, this is the boundary condition 0 degree centigrade on the left side, 100 degree centigrade on the right side. This is the initial condition where let us say initially the plate everywhere it is at 50 degree centigrade. So, you have 5 yellow circles corresponding to which you have, here you have 50 degree centigrade. Now, then what we are doing is, as I said that the if you go by law of conservation of energy, if you know this temperature distribution, we can calculate the heat fluxes at the different phases. Now, what are the phases? So, if you look into the phases of the control volume, if you want to calculate how many control volumes you have, this is the first real control volume, this is the border control volume. This is the first real control volume, this is second, this is third, this is fourth and this is fifth. So, you have five interior control volumes. So, and how many phases are there in this domain? This is the first phase, west phase of this control volume. This is the east phase of this control volume, but this becomes the west phase of this control volume. So, this is the second phase, which is a common phase. This is the third phase, this is the fourth phase, this is the fifth phase and this is the sixth phase. So, you see six different values of Qx and the way we calculate the Qx, when you want to calculate Qx at a at a phase which is which is interior, because note that there are six phases, but two phases are lying at the boundary and there are four phases which are showed by these small red lines. So, whenever you want to calculate Qx at the red phase, the calculation is uh, that you take the temperature of this point minus temperature of this point divided by the distance between the, these two points, which is delta x. Delta x in this problem is taken as unity. So, you have in this case, when you start with an initial condition, you take the difference, it comes out to be 0. So, this is 0 here, here also it is 0, here also it is 0, at this phase also it will come out to be 0. But when you look into the phase which is on the left side, left boundary, to calculate dt by dx, we here what we are doing is we are using a first order method which is called as forward difference. On this side we use a forward difference. So, to calculate dt by dx, it is 50 minus 0 divided by here the distance is half. So, it will be 1 delta x is 1, delta x by 2 will be 0 0.5. So, 50 divided by 0 0.5 give you 100, but when you want to calculate Qx, it is minus k. So, k is taken as unity, so it becomes minus 100. When you go on the right hand side to calculate dt by dx, here again I would like to point out, here you have neighbors only on the one side, one side. Here you had you did forward difference, here you have to do what you call as a backward difference. So, here we are using finite difference method and by backward difference what the way we calculate is, when to calculate dt by dx it will be 100 minus 50 divided by here again distance is 0 0.5, which is 50 divided by 0 0.5 will be 100, when you multiply by minus k it becomes minus 100. So, this way you calculate Qx, once you have calculated Qx, then you go to a control volume one by one all this boundary values will not change. So, this 0 and 100 will remain same, what will change will be the value of temperature at this 5 yellow circles. Now, to calculate this we use this equation, when we use this equation what is Tpn? Tpn is 50 degree centigrade, what is Qw? It is minus 100, what is Qe in this equation? It is 0. So, if we use that you get minus 50 degree centigrade. Similarly, you go to the next control volume, what is the Qw here? 0, Qe 0, Tpn 50. So, that way you calculate all this temperature. Once you have calculated this temperature, you have computed the temperature of the first time step, okay. delta T which in this case we are taking as unity. So, this completes the first time step computation in two stages, first heat flux, second 
temperature computation. Then you go to the next time step. So, from here you get first picture of your let us say animation or a movie. From here you get the second picture. Then you from this temperature distribution again you calculate Qx. Here what I am showing you here is what is basically an explicit method. So, the Qx we are calculating using the temperatures of the previous time level. Note that. So, once you have calculated the temperature of the first time step, then we do the same thing. First we calculate Qx using the procedure which I mentioned. Then we calculate temperature and keep doing this. So, note that we use this equation and obtain this value. Any other question? Yeah, thank you, Professor. Now, no more questions from this end. PhD college, please ask the question. Uh, can I have uh, Professor Puranik? Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, good evening, Professor. Uh, in the differential analysis slide number 15, uh, regarding this uh, subscript notation, uh, is it only for normal stress or it to apply for uh, shear stress? Yes, so the, the question is on differential analysis uh, slide number 15 and uh, what we have shown here is the sign convention for the surface stresses. Uh, and the, the, the question is whether the notation is applicable for uh, shear stresses also or it is applicable only for normal stresses. Uh, so, the answer is that yes, it is applicable for shear stresses as well. Uh, in fact, at the, at the bottom right of the, the slide, what I have shown is an example of what we call a positive shear stress uh, component. So, what is shown here is it is a vertical surface and vertical surface with the unit, unit surface normal for the surface pointing in the positive x direction. And the shear stress which is acting on the vertical surface is uh, shown in the vertical that is y direction and the, the sense or direction in which the shear stress is acting is positive y axis. So, since both the surface normal is pointing in a positive coordinate axis and the shear stress is also pointing out in a, um, uh, in a positive coordinate axis. A positive x for the surface normal, positive y for the shear stress. Uh, we call this situation a positive shear stress. Uh, let me just, uh, so th that basically answers uh, your question I hope. Uh, in general, uh, this uh, sign convention that I have, uh, I have explained in this differential analysis has been taken as I mentioned during the, the lectures. Uh, directly from the sign convention that we have in case of uh, solid mechanics also. So, there is absolutely no difference between a solid mechanics uh, stress uh, uh, analysis type sign convention and what we are doing here. Uh, so, just to re-emphasize that point. Thank you. On next question, uh, regarding this conservative and non-conservative form, uh, I need a small clarification on that like uh, when we have this substantial derivative, is there any physical significance what we can explain to our students uh, the conservative or non-conservative means in this physical significance. Can you please uh, elaborate the physical significance? Thank you. Yes, so the, the next question is on uh, conservative versus non-conservative ways of expressing the, uh, the governing equation. And if uh, we can clearly point out to our students any specific phys physical significance if we have a substantial uh, derivative in the governing equation. Uh, yes, you can. Uh, we actually discussed this a few times, uh, but let me again, uh, uh, again point that out. If we are employing a Lagrangian way of uh, deriving uh, governing equations, we will inherently or automatically end up generating the equation in a non-conservative form and you will see that uh, uh, it will be uh, containing the substantial derivative. Let me quickly try to point this out. Uh, slide number uh, 6 which is now projected on the, on the screen, right at the bottom what we are doing here is that we are deriving the governing equation for conservation of mass by employing the Lagrangian approach. Specifically what we are doing is we are following a given fluid particle which will be always containing the same amount of mass and therefore as we follow this particle in the fluid, what we say is that we are employing our Lagrangian approach and therefore 
the substantial derivative of the content of the mass within this fluid particle will be equal to zero. So in this way, the uh, conservation of mass uh, statement was derived. And as you can see, the final expression came in the form of a substantial derivative. On the other hand, if you employed a uh, balance statement as we had done before, where we, in, uh, where we identify a control volume, and therefore we are employing this as a um, Eulerian approach, when we employ the balance statement and uh, the difference in the mass flux coming in minus the mass, uh, I should say mass flow rates going out is what we say is what is getting stored, etc. Then we automatically generate the conservative form of the uh, same governing equation. So the sh uh, to just summarize then, non-conservative will always come about if you employ Lagrangian approach and it will always contain substantial derivative, which is necessarily implying that we are employing that governing equation or the conservation law to a particular fluid particle by following that particle. That's the, that's the way to express it. Thank you. That's the, that's the way to express it. Last question. Uh, the finite difference solution, slide number 11, uh, about this tri-diagonal matrix algorithm. Uh, in this, on the slide, uh, you are mentioning during your lecture that uh, subscripts i comma that is uh, not clearly visible. Like, uh, is it j minus one or is uh, it uh, i comma j minus one or yes? yes. So, so can you please uh, clarify? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sure. sure. So the the question is on this uh, uh, TDMA or the Thomas algorithm, which is the Gauss elimination uh, algorithm for a tridiagonal system. And uh, the subscripts were not uh, clear um, is what the point is. So yes, I'll, I'll try, to, uh, try to point this out. Uh, so what we do in case of a tridiagonal uh, uh, matrix algorithm is we simply replace the uh, diagonal elements by changing their values according to the expression given on the, on the screen in this forward elimination process. So capital A subscript i comma i which is where my highlighter is standing is simply the diagonal element in the i comma i uh, location so if i is equal to 2 we are talking about the matrix element at 2 comma 2 uh, if you go back to the uh, the matrix representation you will see that all main element sorry main uh, diagonal uh, locations have the value of the element equal to b so they are all the same really. So in each of these situations uh, along the main diagonal, if you look at a 2 comma 2 or a 3 comma 3 or 4 comma 4 or whatever, the element value is always b to begin with. And then that element value is changed as its old value minus the, the ratio is a i comma i minus 1 divided by a i minus 1 comma i minus 1 and that ratio is multiplying a i comma uh, sorry a i minus 1 comma i so there is uh, there is no j here everything is in terms of uh, i's, i's only, only. Uh, thank you professor one small observation uh, towards professor uh, sharma uh, the regarding this animation what he shown it was very effective for the understanding so can we uh, get those animations so that we can use for our lectures? Uh, yes, let me pass the mic on to uh, Professor Sharma. Thank you. Yes, I uh, will be happy to share the animations uh, to all of you. What I am planning, uh, I thought about it and uh, I am planning to create a video of those animations and put it on the Moodle uh, and I will be feel, I will be happy if you have any questions on the procedure how to create those animations. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Amrita Kolam, go ahead. So my my question is uh, with regard to at, uh, slide number 75, topic 1, um, on integral parameters. So in that, uh, the expression for integral expressions for drag force and lift force are given. So in, uh, in that expression, d is equal to integral n dot uh, sigma dot i. 
so um uh, from my understanding n n uh, n is the unit vector normal to the surface so if the surface is horizontal then n would be j so j dot i would become zero so uh, that means drag force is zero if the horizontal plate is uh, so that's my doubt okay, okay. Uh, i should be replaced by j okay okay uh, let us go to the expression for the drag force uh, this question is uh, i have taken an example for uh, flow over a flat plate and i am showing you that the drag force is given by this expression now uh, here i when i am doing calculating the drag force i am uh, let us go to the expression so the expression is n dot sigma uh, now n dot sigma is the expression for drag force is this a now a sigma xx plus b sigma yx now what are this a's and b's in case of a flow over a flat plate for flow over a flat plate a is equals to 0 and b is equals to plus 1 for the top surface and minus 1 for the bottom surface okay so in this case a will come out to be 0 and you will get b which will be plus 1 or minus 1 sigma yx now the sigma yx is equals to why i am showing you the uh, two twice because you have drag force on the top surface as well as on the bottom surface this sigma y x it is uh, mu del u by del y plus del v by del x but on this solid surface at fall del v by del x equals to 0 so you only have del u by del y so uh, it is not equal to 0 because here a is equals to 0 and b is equals to plus 1 on the top surface and we are using this expression any other question now my question is uh, uh, as you have uh, elaborated on this couple uh, sorry this uh, implicit and explicit uh, solution methods can you uh, explain this segregated and coupled solver with some application okay, okay. Uh, the question is uh, uh, i discuss the explicit method and implicit method uh, can I discuss the uh, segregated solver and a coupled solver? Uh, this terms comes into picture when we solve the Navier-Stokes equation. I would suggest you to please hold on till I come to that topic, uh, because right now if I discuss, uh, I had not told you the background of those. So please hold on to that point. I'll discuss that this question. I'll try to cover this topic during that lecture. Can I ask to uh, Professor Priyanex? Yeah, yeah, please, please you. Sure. So slide number 22 of uh, differential analysis. So it's very easy for us to understand this uh, pressure contribution offering normal stresses. But can you uh, explain how this viscous contribution will offer normal stress? Uh, yeah, so the, the question is on uh, slide number 22 differential analysis. Uh, right at the top of the, the slide, I have, uh, I have shown the normal stress as uh, getting a contribution from pressure as well as from a, uh, a viscous contribution. Uh, and the, the question is, uh, it's, uh, it's relatively easy to understand the contribution from pressure, but uh, it's not that easy to understand the, the contribution from uh, the viscous uh, or the viscous contribution to the normal, normal stress. And if we can uh, have a little discussion on that. Um, actually, that's a really good question. Let me, uh, let me say that uh, I was trying to avoid this question, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, it's a very important, uh, important part of the, the, uh, the derivation of the fluid mechanics, uh, in, in particular these momentum equations. Uh, to be honest with you, again, if you want to understand the complete development of these uh, uh, derivations, we need to go into the details of the Stokes' uh, analysis. So let me try to briefly describe what the, the Stokes' analysis was, although we haven't really, um, we haven't really gone into the detail. So if you we, if we go back to the previ previous slide, uh, I, have, uh, I have written here Stokes' assumptions. And uh, the fundamental assumption 
on which the Stokes's relations are worked out is that the stress is proportional to the strain rate, which is simply a Newton's law of viscosity. However, in general, we saw that there are, um, you can imagine that there were, uh, let me go back to, yeah, here. Yeah, here. If you see, we, we remarked that uh, out of these nine components in case of a two-dimensional situation, for example, only six are uh, independent entries, you can say, here. So those six independent entries, each of those is expressed as a, uh, as a uh, in terms of the, uh, the strain rate in uh, different directions. So what ends up happening is that you generate a very large system of uh, equations where each stress component is expressed as a linear combination of all sorts of strain rates that you can think about in the flow situation. So this is what the basis of the Stokes' development is. And then as you keep on simplifying, you realize that many of those uh, constants which in that linear combination result will actually drop out under the assumption of this isotropic behavior. And finally, what, what is left out is, uh, is uh, something that was shown on the, uh, the, the top of the slide number 23. However, if you want to simply have some sort of a physical feel for uh, a viscous uh, contribution, what, is, uh, what can be pointed out is that you imagine a coordinate transformation into which any surface can be made into a normal surface. So in general, any surface has a normal stress and a viscous stress. But in, in the form of a coordinate transformation, any of that surface can be considered to be a normal surface in some rotated coordinate system. And the, the state of stress should remain the same in the rotated coordinate system as well. So that there happens to be a uh, viscous component to the normal, uh, normal stress. Unfortunately, I cannot get into any more detail than this other than pointing out the fact that we have to go to that Stokes' development in its entirety to understand where this uh, viscous contribution to the norm normal stress is coming from. But roughly speaking, what you can imagine is that any surface uh, which will have uh, normal as well as shear stress can be considered to be only a normal surface in some rotated coordinate system. So therefore, to keep the state of stress the same, you always will have some sort of a viscous contribution to the normal stress uh, when you think about the, the surface in the rotated coordinate system. Uh, that's, that's all really I can point out uh, with, the, with the limited background that we have covered. Um, what I will do is I will put up on Moodle a, uh, uh, a small discussion where I will point out a few references where you can go and read the, uh, the Stokes' development in completeness where you'll, you'll actually get to uh, the bottom of this issue uh, in, in, uh, in, in completeness. Thank you. So, uh, exact solution uh, 22. So, we have uh, obtained this du by dy at y equal to h as approximately equal to 0 by comparing the uh, viscosity, that uh, mu terms of air and uh, liquid. Can the same be obtained by uh, considering the fact that at the free surface, u will be u max, and by maximum minima uh, in calculus, du by uh, dy, uh, should it, shouldn't it be zero there since it is maximum, u is maximum at the free surface? Uh, yeah, so the, the point that is getting raised here is uh, exact solution slide number 22. The boundary condition on the free surface was initially written in terms of the continuity of shear stress across the, the free surface and then utilizing the uh, much higher value of viscosity for the for the liquid, it was obtained as a simplified situation of du dy equal to zero at uh, y equal to h. And the question is, if we can simply say that uh, at the free surface, uh, the velocity is going to be a maximum u equal to u max, and therefore by uh, since it is a, it's a maximum, automatically du dy would be equal to equal to zero at y equal to h. Uh, that is actually quite acceptable. Uh, that is perfectly fine if you if you can visualize the fact that uh, the velocity is going to be maximum at the at the free surface. Uh, 
if if you can do that there is there is absolutely nothing wrong in it it's is the one and the same thing that uh, that what we have done at least mathematically uh, what i have tried to point out here is the fundamental physical boundary condition that exists at a um, at a um, liquid air interface uh, if there is uh, no curvature to the interface uh, and the fundamental physical boundary condition is uh, the continuity of shear stress across the interface and uh, that gets appropriately simplified in the form that you see on on the board however what you pointed out is uh, essentially equivalent uh, condition so that is perfectly fine thank you uh, sir <coughs> so it's a general question uh, so uh, we usually consider um, a free vortex uh, to be a rotational flow even though there is there are velocity gradients in the field still we consider free vortex as a rotational so uh, can you just clarify that or uh, so the question is uh, uh, we consider free vortex as an irrotational flow and uh, the uh, even though there are velocity gradients in um, in the flow so uh, if we can provide a clarification to to that <coughs> uh actually if you if you we haven't covered potential flow uh, at all here but uh, if you go to the potential flow theory in any of the standard text you will see that uh, the the condition of uh, irrotationality which is the curl of the velocity field equal to zero gets identically satisfied in the case of your irrotational uh, vortex uh, or the free vortex situation so because del cross v is identically equal to zero in the case of a free vortex we end up calling that as a um, as a um, uh, irrotational vortex so i don't remember exactly the the expressions are but even if the velocity gradients exist they should be such that the curl of the velocity will be equal to zero now we haven't uh, explicitly written out the expression for the curl of velocity in uh, cylindrical polar coordinates uh, which would be required for uh, for the case that we are talking about but if you go back to it it's normally available in any of the standard fluid mechanics books the the expressions for uh, the curl of velocity uh, if you just open it and express the curl of velocity using the the potential that describes this uh, free vortex you will actually realize that the velocity gradients if at all they exist they will act in such a manner that finally the vorticity or the angular velocity will come out to be exactly equal to zero and that's the way we will uh, classify this situation as an irrotational flow situation united nagpur go ahead i have a question related to slide number 31 topic number 2 sir in the you have made a statement that for transient problem this method mean that implicit approach may not be as accurate as an explicit approach can you please elaborate on this point okay <coughs> the question, question is on the statement which i am making here where i am saying that for transient problem this method may not be as accurate as an explicit approach note the word may which i am using here i would like to point out that in a steady state problem you have to do what we call as a, a grid independent study moreover if you want to capture true transient in fluid mechanics you have two class of problems as far as time wise variation is concerned there are problems which finally reaches to a steady state and there are certain class of problems which do not reach to a steady state they reach to an unsteady state which can, which are of different type it could be a periodic state it could be a chaotic state so there is a route to chaos in a transient flow situation so when you are want to simulate or capture a movie or an animation or you want to understand those unsteady flow features uh, like if you want to have capture a, a movie of uh, let us say flow situation when things are changing very fast and if you have a video camera you not only need a good pixel uh, as far as the spatial resolution is concerned but you also need a video camera with a very good frame rate also okay so analogously in computational fluid dynamics analogous to uh, pixel we have what i called as a uh, grid size and analogous to frame rate uh, which is the time instance between the two consecutive picture analogously here we have what we call as a uh, time step so you can uh, appreciate that we need a video camera which has a very good frame rate to capture the true transient 
uh, when the things are changing uh, with respect to time very fast. Analogously, in computational fluid dynamics, when you want to capture uh, true transient, you need a very time, small time step. And in those cases, if you use an implicit approach, your temporal resolution may not be accurate enough. Your frame rate not, may not be that accurate enough. So that way, you may not capture uh, the transient growth in an accurate fash fashion. Because here, you know, the way the uh, computational method evolves is that the data of one picture is used to calculate the data of the next picture. Okay, so the temporal resolution may not be good enough if you use a larger time step with an implicit approach. Thank you. Yeah, this is Bhalchandra Puranik. I'd like to add one more uh, comment to this uh, this discussion, uh, and would like to point out, in fact, that the the finite difference uh, lab session that uh, that was carried out yesterday. Uh, we solved this uh, diffusion equation, unsteady diffusion equation, with both explicit as well as implicit approaches. Uh, if you if you want to go back and uh, look at the the implicit solution that was worked out, uh, one of the one of the things that were tried was uh, using different time steps in that implicit solution, and along with the numerical solution, the analytical solution obtained through the series was was also getting uh, plotted and superimposed on the numerical solution so if you if you want you can just go back and uh, carefully see that if you take larger time steps in the implicit solution it doesn't actually follow the analytical solution closely so the accuracy in the implicit solution is lost if you uh, if you take larger time steps which is exactly what was getting pointed out by professor sharma right now so just as a, another point to uh, reemphasize you can verify that yourself through the the lab session from yesterday thank you Sir, one more thing I want to ask, sir, like uh, the point you made, sir, when we talk about implicit method, we call it as unconditionally stable. Then I don't think it is like, I don't understand how it is dependent upon the time step which we choose. Uh, yeah, so the, the question is about uh, the nomenclature used along with uh, implicit method as unconditionally stable. Uh, uh, see, the, the, the way to interpret this uh, stability is that no matter what time step value you choose, the implicit method does not explode and it will always work and it will give you a solution. Whereas the explicit method actually will crash. So that's the difference between implicit and explicit. Uh, the implicit method will always work whatever the time step value that you may provide to it. It may not give you an accurate solution, that's a different thing, but uh, it, is, it is always going to work. Also, to add to that very quickly, uh, remember what Professor Sharma just told you a few minutes back that many times uh, a steady state is true steady state is re achieved at the end of the transient uh, situation and if you are interested in actually capturing the true steady state of a transient problem uh, going there quickly is what many times is uh, required and then you can take these larger time steps using the implicit method and reach the, the, the steady state fast. Here, obviously, the transient solution is not going to be accurate, but you don't care about that because your ultimate objective is to capture the, the final steady state. So that way, many people utilize the implicit method as uh, a vehicle to reach the steady state uh, faster. Thank you. So one more so one more question, sir. As we have talked about the validity of continuum model, sir, can we have some criteria to to choose when the flow is incompressible or compressible? Do we have any number or such criteria? Uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, we, we talked about the continuum approach and uh, a number was pointed out, uh, the Knudsen number, based on which we decided roughly when the situation is continuum or not. So similarly, if there is any criterion to decide whether a flow is incompressible or compressible, and uh, yeah, the, the most standard way to classify the, the flow being compressible or incompressible is using the, uh, the Mach number, which is the uh, ratio of velocity of fluid to the ratio of sound speed in the fluid. So that that ratio, that Mach number, if it is roughly less than 0.3, this is again a rule of thumb, but roughly it, if, if it is less than 0.3, we treat the flow to be incompressible. If the Mach number in the flow is greater than 0.3, roughly, uh, 
uh, we have to treat the flow as compressible. So that's the, the standard uh, rule of thumb classification. Thank you. It is, it is regarding differential analysis 21. Yes, sir. In which in the Stokes and assumptions, the second assumption uh, was uh, isotropic fluid. So can you please uh, explain briefly what is isotropic fluid and what is non-isotropic fluid and give examples uh, uh, for each. So the question is on slide number 21 differential analysis where we talk about the, the fluid being isotropic. So what does, uh, what does that mean? Uh, the, the, <coughs> the, the standard meaning associated with the words isotropic uh, is that uh, if you look at any direction within the flow at a given point, the fluid will have the same behavior in terms of the stress and strain rate relation. That is what the, the assumption is. And to, to some extent, the assumption is a simplification. No fluid in real life will behave exactly as what is described using this isotropic uh, assumption. However, uh, most fluids come very, very close. Uh, the, the fluids such as air or uh, water, which are our more standard fluids, and most other fluids that are used as uh, working fluids in most of the technological applications are actually conforming quite reasonably well to this isotropic nature, which is, again, any direction within the flu fluid that you can think of at a point, the stress and strain rate relation remains the same. Um, to be honest with you, I'm not too aware of uh, an iso an, or, or a non-isotropic fluid. Most likely, my uh, if I have to guess, actually, uh, it will be in some sort of a chemical engineering situation where perhaps uh, the, the kinds of fluids that uh, end up getting used are perhaps non-isotropic. I myself never have dealt with a, a situation where uh, there is a non-isotropic fluid uh, to, be, to be handled. As I said, most of the fluids that mechanical engineers and aerospace engineers in particular will, will deal with are conforming to this um, direction independent behavior quite, quite reasonably. Remember, everything is a model. So there is nothing <laughs> absolutely true about any of it. Finally, uh, everything is a model and we say that uh, uh, whatever comes closest to the model is good and, and we move on. Uh, same is the case with your Navier-Stokes equations also. Thank you. Sir, the second question is uh, regarding differential analysis uh, 33. It is on the simplified form of energy equation. So <coughs> the equation which is written in the box of uh, style number 33 in differential analysis from that you subtracted <coughs> momentum equation by taking divergence on it and obtained an equation which is given in cell number 34 of differential analysis. So <coughs> in the e momentum equation, uh, you have not considered that viscous, uh, viscous terms and uh, body force terms. I don't know, I could not follow exactly how it was going on. Can you please explain? Uh, yeah. So the question is on the energy equation derivation in the differential analysis. And in particular, the one manipulation that we did uh, on slide number 33, where we obtained the uh, equation for the total uh, specific uh, energy and then subtracted what we called a mechanical energy equation that was formed by taking the dot product of the momentum equation with, velo uh, with velocity. And the question is, uh, in the momentum equation, we are taking only the pressure gradient term and not uh, anything else, the viscous terms and the, the body force term. And the question is why? So uh, actually, it's simply a, uh, an assumption or a simplification under which we are carrying out this, uh, this derivation. Let me go back to the uh, slide number 30, where we have uh, listed the simplifying assumptions at the bottom, if you, if you now see where my highlighter is. Uh, the first point uh, is is what uh, says that 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 we are uh, neglecting the viscous forces altogether in comparison with other terms. This is again a simplification, and the simplification is to be interpreted in the fashion that for low speed flows, which typically exist in mechanical engineering, uh, I just talked about that Mach number being less than 0.3, etc. In general. If you, if you want to look at the Mach numbers that the standard mechanical engineering flows are working at, 
it is actually very very close to zero in fact so it is something like 0 0.05 or 0 0.08 or something of that sort in situations like these the, uh, the the what we call these as low speed flows and the velocity gradients are actually very very small if the velocity gradients are small the viscous dissipation work which uh, discusses the or which describes i should say the conversion of kinetic energy into thermal energy is actually really really negligible in comparison with other terms in the equation so that's an implicit assumption under which we are uh, we are uh, we are working here what we are saying is that we will simply assume the small yeah so under the assumption of uh, these low speed flows wherein we can reasonably uh, well argue that the viscous effects are altogether neglected uh, we are working this similarly the body force have been simply neglected in this simplifying uh, derivation uh, in the sense that the body forces will be considered to be much smaller in comparison with the pressure forces that's the implicit built in assumption in the entire derivation and that is why you don't see those terms in uh, in this equation here that that's all it Thank you. Sir, my last question, sir. In fact, I was confused because, you know, on the side number 35, uh, you, have, you have, like, you know, taken the body forces in, under, uh, into the account. And whereas in the energy equation, you have not taken those things in, under, under account. That's why I was having the confusion. Anyhow, uh, my third question is... Uh, uh, le let, me, let, me, uh, let me talk to you about that for a minute. Actually, it's a good point. It's a good point. I'm sorry to interrupt. But it's a good point that, that you are bringing out. On slide number 35, I have written the momentum equation including the body forces, whereas in energy term, I, am, uh, I'm, I have not included it. Uh, the idea is that the energy term, the energy equation was derived as an independent equation looking at only the energy contents. And even though you may have the body forces in the momentum equation, when it comes to the energy calculation, the idea is that the energy terms related to body forces, which are essentially potential energy, are uh, are negligible, and therefore it has been neglected. Uh, but I I really want to point out that it's a very good observation, and thanks for that. Thank you, sir. Uh, and my third question is regarding uh, like this uh, stress and strain relationships. And you, we like we have derived all the universal equations under the uh, very simplified assumptions. So, can you please guide uh, or give a couple of references where we can see all these uh, detailed analysis, or in, in fact, general analysis? Uh, yeah. So the uh, the question is on these stress strain rates relationships or the Stokes development, and without really go getting into each and every of those uh, details we have really uh, looked at only the final expressions more or less and talked a little bit about those and the question is whether we can uh, point out a reference here where the entire development can be seen so uh, the best way to to look at this is if you if you don't mind noting down as i'm i'm writing right now i'll i'll uh, mention uh, two books which are uh, which are very good to uh, to look in, into uh, both of them are actually somewhat old fluid mechanics books and one is by Shames, S-H-A-M-E-S, -S -E Irving Shames. Let me write it on the board, whiteboard. So, so this is one book and the other one which is also a, a somewhat old book where a nice uh, treatment on this uh, Stokes's development is provided is by S W. Yuan. And the title of the book is uh, Foundations of Fluid Mechanics. So these two, I will, uh, from my point of view, recommend for detailed Stokes's development and uh, once you start going through it you will realize why I have decided to omit that here it's a it's a fairly long drawn out uh, derivation and one has to have uh, sufficient patience to go through the derivation and uh, it's really up to uh, the individual to 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 work through all the steps as as they are getting worked out so I would suggest that uh, those who are really interested should uh, should go to these two and uh, perhaps they can 
they can follow it from the background that we have already generated here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And there is one more question from one of my colleagues. How the body forces are developed? So the, the question is how body forces are developed. Um, so that in general, the body forces are developed if, uh, if, if your fluid material or any material, for example, is operating in some sort of a force field. Uh, and that force field can be typically the gravitational force field as, uh, as what we have, been, we have been looking at. So the, the, the body force, for example, that we can talk about for ourselves, that is, uh, if you consider uh, the human body as a uh, fluid particle or solid particle, whichever way you want to look at, we are in a we are situated in a uh, gravitational force field, and the weight, which is our mass multiplied by the gravitational acceleration, is nothing but the body force that uh, we are going to experience in this gravitational force field. Force field. So similarly, any material which has a non-zero mass content if it is operating in a gravitational force field, will experience a body force, uh, which will be given by the mass of that particle times the, the gravitational acceleration. And by, by and large, the, the most common body force that we need to talk about in fluid mechanics is because of the, the gravitational force. Some additional body forces in some very special situations can be uh, incorporated where you have something like a charged particle or a charged uh, electrically charged fluid moving in an electrostatic field where again uh, because of the electrical charges introduced in the fluid and the motion of those in an electrostatic field additional electromagnetic forces are generated which are also acting as body forces in the sense that they are acting over the entire mass of the fluid. So this is a couple of standard uh, situations where we have to deal with uh, the body forces. For all practical purposes, the only important body force that most mechanical engineering people will ever face is really only the gravitational force. Thank you.